Hey, what's up? It's GW coming to you live once again. Hey, listen, um, a couple of things I want to touch on. One, I haven't been doing movie talk as, as much as I should. I kind of got injured a while back, and the injury is now just starting to aggravate me. So I'm going to go for an MRI, and we're going to take it from, well, the doctor's going to take it from there. So, I don't know what's going to happen today, guys, but... Believe me, we're going to take care of it. It's an old neck injury, you know. Uh, second thing is I got, a t I got a few new subscribers, and this is long overdue. I just want to say welcome, and uh, I hope you guys are enjoying, you know, my thoughts on the movies. With that being said, I've had an interesting subscriber comment on my Jaws video. He wanted to know what I thought of Jaws 2. So, Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. Batman... You know who you are. This one's for you. My thoughts on Jaws 2 are as follows. First of all, the film is more terrifying, I think, than the first one due to the fact they made the shark more monstrous. They made it look more menacing, and it works. And they actually did a pretty good job of, instead of it terrorizing the beach, terrorize a regatta race, which is pretty cool. The one thing that I will say that takes away from the movie is the absence of Richard Dreyfuss' character, Matt Hooper. If you guys have seen the movie, which I know everybody has, Matt Hooper is studying at the Oceanography Institute and is not present in the movie. It kind of leaves a big chunk left over. The other cool thing about Jaws 2 is the gore scenes. There's not many of them, but they are a little bit shocking for the PG-13 rating that it got, or PG rating, which I'm not going to go into that. Um, I was just playing around with the DVD. There are some deleted scenes that were taken out, which I believe were put back into the TV version to sort of make up for time. One of them is... The underwater footage of when the shark attacks the helicopter pilot, the sequence where the helicopter pilot is going to tow them to shore, there was a about a minute, minute and a half, two minute clip of the pilot underwater trying to get his safety belt under, you know, off, and you see the shark. And I know I've seen that in um, the, uh, the TV versions of Jaws 2. There's another one where it's called At Home with the Brodies. It just elaborates on the fact that Michael is told not to go sailing. And he storms off to his room, and then Chief Brody and Ellen Brody sort of talk in their bedroom. Nothing major there. Um, another deleted scene in there is called The Vote, which I know I've seen. It's where... The Amityville, you know, beach council gets together and they decide what to do. And then that's when Roy Schneider's character, Chief Brody, is waiting outside the police day or outside the uh, the voting thing. It doesn't add to much, but it does flesh out the arc of, of that angle. Now, as a whole. As a story, it fits. But like I said, the the missing Richard Dreyfus character would have been phenomenal. It would have made the film a much better picture. But, you know, I this is just my thoughts on it and reading everything and seeing Jaws, the 40th anniversary edition. Richard Dreyfus did not think that that film was going to be as big as it is. So he did pass on the sequel. That's why he is just merely mentioned in the film. And then it became a huge hit. And then number three, pretty much... Number three basically just put a target on the franchise. And number four sunk it to death. And we'll get into that later. But, um... There is some good action sequences in Jaws 2. Um, some frightening ones. You know, especially with the regatta, you have all kinds of possibilities, and I think they capitalized on that. 
Um, when I saw this picture, the uh, the thing that stood out it is, like I said, it was more shocking than the first one. It was more, you know, envelope pushing, I guess, for a PG or a PG-13, depending on how you rate it. So, there's that. One of the other cool things about this film is that if you guys ever watch Christine, Keith Gordon plays one of the teenagers in Regatta. And he he's a pretty cool actor. You guys should check out Christine if you haven't seen it. He portrays Arnie Cunningham to a T. For those guys who don't know what Christine's about, it's a Stephen King vehicle in which a teen becomes obsessed with the 1958 Plymouth Fury. It's one of my most favorite movies of all time. And you guys should read the book before you watch the movie. But anyway, back to Jaws 2. One of my favorite and unforgettable sequences in the movie is Tina in the movie. Tina is a teenager. Her boyfriend gets attacked by the shark. I believe his name is Arnie. Swim, Arnie, swim. Yeah. And basically that whole sequence is pretty much terrifying where he gets knocked off the boat and is swimming back and Tina watches in horror as her boyfriend gets swallowed up by the shark. Uh, it starts out with without a diving sequence and a girl getting, you know, mauled to death in the ocean. It, it skips that. It goes right. It tries to outdo the first one by having a boating accident. You know, that's how we open up the shark menacing Amityville or Amity, yeah, Amity, I keep saying Amityville, um, the other thing I want to touch on is the death of the shark, now in the first film he was blowed up by an oxygen tank and a bullet, they kind of had to go back to the well with this one, and just sort of figure out how are you going to top the first one, which if you watch this film, it's all about trying to do it better, get some more kills in there, Get the storyline fleshed out and try to make a bigger demise for the shark. If you all know, you know, the shark gets electrocuted in this one and it's done pretty cleverly. Um, they add the speed of sound. The other thing that throughout the movie, the shark becomes more menacing. First you see it take out a, a skier. Then later on in the film, shortly after that, there's a killer whale that washes on shore. And you really get to see what kind of carnage this shark can do. But I know, as moviegoers, we're not supposed to remember the first one. You know, all we saw was the remains of Christine Watkins, you know, spilled out on the beach in the first one. And then, of course, later on, Quint's demise, which really put, you know, what the shark can do in focus. I'm not counting the Ben Gardner kill from the first one because all you saw was his eye missing. That scene was completely taken out of the first film, but it was graphically put into the book. So... You know, the other thing that they did pretty cool was they actually had Chief Brody, who was fired from the police force, go after the shark, like rogue style, and it, it, it has become a trend. You know, he did it in the first one, he's doing it in this one, and like I said, I'm not even going to go into the third film because that's just off the wall ridiculous. So, the Tina... Tina's boyfriend attack was pretty cool, and later on you see the uh, the shark go after Michael and Sean and the Brody kids, as well as their friends in the regatta. Um, having watched the deleted scenes, like I said, they don't add much to the film, just enough to flesh out if you wanted a extended, sort of extended cut of the film. But in all honesty, the film does work. It's a much, much better streamlined production than the first one. The uh, the acting is great. You have you have uh, you know all the actors from the first one, including the mayor. You know he returns. Roy Schneider returns. Lorraine Gray returns, or Gary, however you want to say her name. Can't even remember. Uh, basically well done film the uh, the only thing 
that, like I said, detracts from the movie as Richard Dreyfuss' character. I wish they could have had him come back, at least at the very end. You know, maybe make a cameo as the, uh, you know, right before the shark gets killed or something. Or even have him a scene where he's in the Oceanography Institute and calls, you know, Roy Schneider's character, Matt Brody. And, uh, or Chief Brody. Sorry. You know. That would be my only thing. Um, now the film is, uh, it was pretty terrifying when I first saw it, you know. And uh, John Williams does the score from the first one. He did the the theme song also, or not the theme song, the theme music, da 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 right? Now I believe this picture was directed by Joe Alves. Who really did an awesome job. But let me double check on that. Because I don't want to get my facts wrong. And it's hard to read DVD print when it's that small. Sorry guys I was wrong. It was written by a guy named Janot Swark. Who. Really. Did a heck of a job. I've never heard of this guy before. But apparently he's known for directing Jaws too. That's it. Um, there really isn't much else to say um the one thing i will touch on is the after in the movie the uh the boating accident the corpse that washes on shore that's really burnt and looks pretty fried that was pretty well done guys the makeup in that was pretty pretty awesome and it it's enough to go whoa you know this film starts out with a bang and as for jaws 3 I'm just going to say this, you know, whenever I first heard that, you know, Jaws was coming into 3D, you know, I, I wasn't around for that. I was a little kid, so obviously I didn't get to watch that, you know, at the theater and see what actually went on. But it was a cool concept. Let's put Jaws in your face. Let's have it, you know, jump out the screen at you to make it real. The problem with all that, it was just a gimmick film. And... The plot line, you know, was pretty ridiculous, but not as ridiculous as the fourth film. You know, they take a great white shark and they put it in captivity in SeaWorld. And then the mama shark, it dies. The mama shark comes back to raise revenge. And it is really, really a very stupid movie. It's not well done. The thing that sunk it, though, is that I can remember... <laughs> watching it on TV. The one thing I will say, though, before I, I, I ripped that movie apart, was the gore effects. There's a lot more blood in part number three. There's a lot more carnage. And it just seemed like every time you turned around, you know, there was something shocking. Like the guys walking through the, uh, the SeaWorld-type tunnel. There was a floating head that, you know, skittered by, you know, as well as a really ripped-up corpse. Um, so the gore effects were done pretty cool. The storyline sunk, and Louis Gossett Jr.'s overreacting kind of makes the film campy. It was just not a good picture on all accounts. The 3D was horrible, especially put on TV. If you guys don't believe me, check out YouTube. I'm sure you can find it. The one thing, though, that kind of kind of makes the film worth watching as well as aside from Louis Gossett Jr.'s overreacting was Dennis Quaid. Dennis Quaid plays Michael and Michael Brody and if you watch the evolution you know what you what nobody hears in the film is that in part four he worked at SeaWorld you know or in part two he says I'm going to SeaWorld so basically it was just sort of you know, a done deal. Three was okay for a corny, campy movie, but it, it really, really wasn't great. And when it premiered on Blu-ray, it was not brought to 3D right away or DVD. In fact, I just got a three 3D cut of the film. Oh, it was a couple years ago. They actually put it out. 
because I remember when I got my 3D player, guys, I signed up for it. Amazon had this thing where you sign up for it and you can get alerts. It was at least two years after I got my player, and those have been, you know, outdated. Outdated. Now everything's 4K, 8K, 9K. You know what I mean? Then came Jaws the Revenge. This film was so ridiculous that I actually, whenever I was a kid, you know, you love monster movies when you're a kid. So I went and I went to the theater down here in Butler, local pen theater, and I watched Jaws 4. And I thought it was one of the greatest carnage-filled movies in the world. Of course, when you're a kid, you don't know what's going on with it. Then I started reading up on the premise. The premise of this film is ridiculous, guys. Ellen Brody loses her son, Sean, to a shark attack. And immediately you get the feeling that the shark is now not a shark anymore. It's not a predatory animal. It's a stalker. It is a, you know, boogeyman sort of deal with a grudge against the Brody family for killing its relatives and family. So now you have Ellen Brody going to, you know... The Bahamas, the shark follows him. Michael is now working alongside Mario Van Peebles, and they're collecting conch for research. Conch is a sort of shellfish, and I don't need to tell you what happens. They run face first into the into the shark, and then it becomes a sort of battle of okay, this is personal. I'm gonna end the shark. Ellen Brody goes on a mythical quest, and on a mythical quest, a What's the word I'm looking for? A uh, vigilante mission to kill the shark. This film has some of the best star power of a Jaws film. It has Lance Guest, Mario Van Peebles, and um, I'm trying to think of the other guy's name is. Hang on, I'll get you the thing. It's too early in the morning and I can't think right now, so hang tight. Michael Caine. Sorry about that. I was going to say Dean Caine, but I know I was wrong there. So it does have a lot of star power. It also has one of the most coolest attack sequences in which little Althea gets on a banana boat and gets a shark attack. Very bloody very cool, Rem reminiscent of the Alex Kintner kill from the first film. The thing that makes the film fall apart is that Jaws 1 and 2, you go, okay, they could kind of happen, you know, but they're far-fetched, but they could happen. You know, they were set in an area, you know, in the ocean where sharks could attack. Jaws 4, sharks cannot live in warm water. So, therefore, by definition, the whole movie falls apart and sinks. And I think Universal lost a shit ton of money on this. So, it, it falls apart under the story it's trying to tell. Now, yes, every movie has a right to stretch reality and limits and boundaries. But number four is by far the worst the worst gimmick. And, and for all the star power that it had, you would think that they could come up with a different story. Uh, a couple years ago, I heard there was an internet rumor floating around that they were going to turn Jaws into an R-rated movie with Tracy Morgan as Matt Hooper. You can't touch the original. You know, if you go back, the first two are the best. You know, and I, I've said it before in different reviews. You know, basically, number four sank the franchise because it was ridiculous People were tired of seeing the Brody family battle the shark. And, and with the with the film the way it was and having Roy Schneider's character killed off by a heart attack. And that's the other stupid thing. They He battled the shark twice, you know, in these films, guys. And the character was brave. I mean, he'd go after him. He'd go after the shark. But in number four, they had him die of a heart attack. They mentioned it. And they said the fear killed him. Well, if a guy takes on a shark twice, he's not afraid of the shark. He's not afraid of it happening. Okay, so that's crap. You know, that's like saying Rambo's afraid of the Vietnamese because they could kill him. No. 
No, guys. The character of Martin Brody, or Sheriff Brody, he would have taken that shark on five, six, seven, eight times, okay? So the writers didn't know what they were doing. Jaws 4 is only good for one thing, watching the franchise fall apart. The direction was crazy. The attacks were... There wasn't many in there. There really wasn't. There was, you know, Sean Brody getting his arm ripped off. There was the banana boat kill. There was maybe another kill. And I think there was one more. If you don't count the shark's demise, which is the other thing I want to touch on. When Jaws 4 premiered, the shark was killed one way. They changed that in the TV version. It was killed in a different way. There was more footage to the shark attack kill. You know, or the shark kill. If you watch the film, like I said, it, it just basically falls apart. The reality is not there. The shock value isn't there. The star power was. I mean, that was the only thing. So unless you're a diehard Mario Van Peebles fan, you know, Michael Caine fan, Lance Guest, or... You know, or you actually just really like really movies that really take reality and throw it out the window. Your Jaws Four is ridiculous. Now, in the book, which I did read, there is a subplot in which a voodoo shaman curses Ellen Brody again in having the shark come back and stalk her family. Gee. Sounds like the plot of the first book for Ellen Brody having an extra marital affair with with Matt Hooper, and having the shark punish the Brody family again. So we're going, we're retreading, you know, back to the same idea. So anyway, uh, Batman, Bruce Wayne, I hope that uh, that little rant does explain my feelings about Jaws 2, and as well as my elaborated feelings on the falling of the franchise. And to tell you the truth, people sometimes ask me, do I want to watch a remake of Jaws? I think the only way it would work in this day and age is if you made it a heavily violent R-rated movie. You get people afraid once again. Because that's what was missing in these films. Was the fear of the shark. Because when you watched one, I don't care who you were. You were afraid to even go in a swimming pool, man. You turn around, Jaws would, you know, get you. You know, rip off your leg, tear off your arm, whatever. If you make it a heavily violent R-rated movie... Where the kills and attacks are so vicious that it would scare you once again. I think if you put that in and you mixed it in with a really great story and a really cool cast and you made the plot believable, it would work. The problem is, guys, it's probably never going to be done. There's no way you can top a classic. That's my thoughts on Jaws 1 and 2. So... Uh, as well as the demise of the franchise. So, anyway, Bruce Wayne, I hope that answered your question. Peace.